السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله I'd like to welcome you back to the last uh, lecture session for tonight. Um, just before that, uh, I was reminded to clarify a rumor going round that perhaps this is our last conference of the year. Um, numerous uh, brothers have been approached by numerous people uh, saying that they have heard this year's conference is the last, and we don't know where it's emanating from. We don't know who started it. But I suppose the nature of the, the gathering permits easy spread of information. Um, we used to do conferences biannually. It's going to be, inshallah, annually from since last uh, two years. So we don't know where it's coming from, and we intend to con reconvene again, inshallah, next year. Um, Sheikh Salim al is going to be talking now for, uh, about Islam, the clear hope, the promises of Allah for this world and the hereafter. But after that, a small break of half an hour, and then tonight, inshallah, is the big night where we try and address as many questions as possible. So we'll try and come back at 10.30 and try and answer as many questions, and that tend to go on till about well, at least midnight, if not one or two in the morning. So without further deliberation, I hand you over to Sheikh Salim al-Amri. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا إنه من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد our topic for tonight, Islam is the clear hope. And beyond any doubt, it is the clear hope for the saving and <coughs> rescuing humanity in general. Humanity is suffering beyond any doubt. Mankind is lost beyond any doubt. And Islam is the only solution for all these sufferings which man is going through. And all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who kept his deen, the Islam, alive. And the word of Islam, supremely high. And it will remain victorious till the day of judgment. That's what Allah promised. That is the promise of Allah. And when Allah promised, it's going to pass. Allah says, هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون. It's he who has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to proclaim it over all religion, even though the pagans may detest and does not or don't like it. Yes, the enemies of Islam. The truth rejectors, those who deny the truth, and those who are concealing the truth. They are concealers of the truth and they are rejectors of the truth. They know the truth and they are rejecting it. And there are others who are concealing the truth. But the truth is going to prevail. And the religion of the truth, which is Islam, is going to prevail over any other ism. Judaism, Christianity, Christianity, Buddhism, any ism, Islam is going to supersede all that. That's what Allah decreed. And what Allah decreed is going to pass. Whether they like it or not. And all they are actually in a losing battle. Because you are fighting Almighty Allah. And you cannot defeat Allah. So the religion of Allah is going to be, remain supreme and is going to prevail. The only thing, brothers, that we should work hard, that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor us and give us this honor, that we witness and see the victory of this deen and the spread of Islam. And we are seeing it. Despite the weakness of Muslims, Islam is gaining grounds day by day. Their children are coming into the deen. 
despite all the propaganda and the negative images they are portraying and depicting. But Islam, that is the secret. This is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah said, I will spread it. And no one can stop it. And Islam indeed is giving and providing solutions for all this misery and the sufferings man is going through. Creation, humanity, mankind is in need to know his creator, to know his purpose in this life, why he is here. All these questions that begin with WH you should answer, and only Islam gives the answer. Only Islam gives the answer, and only the Muslim knows what he's going to, and who brought him here, and what is required from him, and all these questions. Only Muslim knows that. If you ask them what is going to happen to you in the grave, they don't know. Because there is nothing mentioned in their book. But everything is mentioned in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's code of life. It's governing all aspects of life. So man needs to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the correct knowledge to know about Allah is only in the book of Allah. The last book which is not adulterated, remained intact as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised. And here, I would like to quote what Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu said. He said, a time will come when all the handholds of Islam will be untied. And that is when a person grows up in Islam without knowing jahiliyyah. What does it mean? It means a Muslim will not appreciate the blessing and the value of this deen because he didn't know the jahiliyyah. He didn't experience living in the darkness. So he cannot appreciate the value of the light. So those who are born Muslims, they don't feel this value, the value of Islam. But those who have been in the Jahiliyyah, they know, that's why they stick to it. Say, no, 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 no. I don't want to go back. Because I know how, it, how the Jahiliyyah tastes. And I know that life when I'm away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know, brothers and sisters, the status of the world prior to the advent of Islam. Allah looked upon the inhabitants of the earth and he abhorred and disliked and hated all of them except fragments as mentioned in the hadith. Handfuls among the people of the book. So when the Prophet ﷺ came, the whole earth, the whole world was in complete darkness. And the light shone in Arabia. The wahi which revived, revived the dead nation, the Arabs, who, who were barbaric, burying their daughters alive, alcoholic, all ills. That is the miracle of the Prophet Wasallam, reviving that dead nation. And the proof is in front of my eyes now. And the proof, millions of Muslims all over the globe. Ready to sacrifice and give their souls to defend their beloved Prophet ﷺ. That is the proof. So the situation, Arabia was in complete darkness. And he, in few years, he educated them. Umar ibn Khattab, who buried his daughter alive, became the one when the shaitan sees him, runs away. That is the product of the upbringing of Muhammad sallallahu Transforming the life of Umar from an alcoholic, brutal person into a man who has two dark lines on his face because of the tears. Always crying. And it has been reported that he said, Woe to me, woe to me. 
If I sleep the night, I will lose myself. And if I sleep during the day, I will lose my ummah. I am in charge of them. I am responsible. I wish that I was a hair. Hair on the chest of Abu Bakr. So, that was the jahiliya before Islam. That was the jahiliya before Islam. And in few years, that jahiliya washed away. So, religion, which is Islam, which is a practical, solving all the problems of the humanity. A religion that forms the harmony. The harmony within yourself. The harmony with your surroundings. There is a peaceful coexistence between you and surroundings. That is Islam. It creates the balance between the body and the soul. Soul is crying. And I'm going to quote what is happening. Young people are killing themselves. Why? When everything is at their hand, everything is provided. Because man consists of two parts, body and soul. We are working hard on the body and we neglected the soul. That created a state of an equilibrium within the person himself. So a man needs the religion by nature. So thus I'm going to give a few aspects of the, mention some of the features of this last testament, the religion of Islam, the deen of Islam, the last message for the guidance of mankind. First of all, it's a complete way of life. It's a code of life. You want the proof? Take any book of the fiqh and just take a quick glance at the index and see. It starts with the tahara and the salah and this and then transactions, then jihad. Everything is there. There is no single aspect in life that is not covered in the religion of Islam. So it is a code for life. It is a universal message. Universality exists only in Islam. Universality is not in Christianity. Christ, peace and blessings of Allah said, I have been sent only for the lost sheep of Israel. That's what the Bible says. So he is saying that my message is directed for the Christians. And the missionaries are trying to push it down our throat in the name of Christ that we have to baptize the Gentiles, the whole world. When the message itself is not universal. But the univer- universality is the Islam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah sent the Prophet ﷺ as a rahma, kindness, mercy for the entire humanity, mankind. So the universality is Islam. Walk order, a new world order is in the Islam. They are boasting and they are saying we want the people to know. We want to teach the people values and ethical values and manners. That's what they are saying now. What can you offer us? You have no ethics. You have no values. All these things went down the gutter. So what can you offer us? What you can teach us as Muslims? You will teach us generosity? Kindness? How many millions of people being killed? In the First World War and the Second World War. Who killed them? Muslims? Who killed them? Muslims? If the Muslim even today, and inshallah one day they will possess mass destructive weapons, and nuclear weapons, but they will not harm anyone. Simply because they believe it stops them from using this against humanity. Islam is the only belief 
that teaches the fighters don't harm any hermit in his synagogue or church. Don't kill children. Don't kill women. That's only Islam. We have seen in history, in the current history, what they did to the Muslims. They opened their tummies and they took the children and they cut their throats. That will never happen in Islam. And history writes. And history is a witness. So Islam is the only universal deen. And it's going to supersede. It's a revealed religion. It's not something Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam concocted or fabricated. It is from Allah. It is guidance for mankind. And the mashayikh, because of the limitation of the time frame, many of the prophecies they didn't touch them. The proofs of the prophethood of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'll just give one example that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to take guards to guard him. In the beginning. When Allah revealed to him, Wallahu ya'asimuka min nas and Allah protects you from the harm of mankind, he said to the gods, leave me alone. One German journalist became a Muslim when she read this ayah. She said, this is enough for me. Because man can cheat anyone but will not cheat himself. Why did he take the risk? When no one asked him, but because he is receiving revelation from Allah. And Allah told him, I am protecting you. So no need to put guards. He said to the guards, leave me alone. When the, the uh, king of Persia, he received the letter from the Prophet ﷺ, he tore it. And the Prophet ﷺ said, oh, oh Allah, tear his kingdom into pieces. And he was assassinated. And what the king of Persia did, he sent to his governor in Yemen, Badan, and he said, send two strong Persian men to Medina to bring Muhammad dead or alive. And they went to Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ, and they had grown their mustaches and shaved their beards. So brothers, no more shaving, okay? <laughs> because you love the Prophet ﷺ, aren't you? Yeah, you do. So, grow their beards. Okay? Kiss goodbye to the razor. Okay? No more razors. Okay. So the Prophet ﷺ, he looked at them. And then he lowered his gaze and he said, who commanded you? Who told you to shave your beards and to grow your mustaches? They said, our Lord. He said, my Lord commanded me to trim my mustache and to grow my beard. Go back to your governor and tell him, my Lord killed his Lord last night. Go back. <laughs> that Allah killed the, the emperor. So the governor in Yemen, he said, okay, now the man, he put all his eggs in one basket, let us wait. And the news arrived from Persia. And in those days, there were no faxes or things like that, okay? And the news arrived. What happened? The, ki the king was assassinated. Who killed him? So and so. And they appointed his daughter to be his successor. And the Prophet ﷺ said, no nation will prosper or succeed if, the woman, if a woman is ruling them. And we have two already ruling us. Okay? So, status of women in this deen. Sisters, it's high time to appreciate the gift that Allah gave you in Islam. Women are envying you. Your status in Islam, no woman can achieve. You are a queen sitting on her throne at home. The man is the one who's, who's sweating for the bread. And Allah has given you the most beautiful job and the noblest one, bringing human beings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected you from the, from the cradle till the grave. Your parents are looking after you, then your husband, then your children. Respected, protected, a jewel, precious. And see the woman in this jahiliyyah was what they call it civilization. Woman is humiliated. Sex industry are using women. Fashion industry are using the woman. There is no single product of food except you send a naked woman in it. Why? What does that have to do with the soap or things like that? See, to what the status they are humiliating the woman? Just yes, to sell their products. And Islam respected you. Saved you. Placed you in a lofty status. 
That is the status of women in Islam. Islam said, as the Prophet ﷺ said, the Jannah, there are two hadiths here, and the brothers, they get confused. There are two hadiths. One hadith says, Al-Jannah tahta aqdam al heaven or paradise is under the feet of the mothers. This is weak hadith. The other hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, that the Jannah is at the feet of the mothers. Not under at. So be there. At the feet of your mother, you want the Jannah. Al-Hassan al-Basri, one day he came out and he was delayed. And they asked him, why you came delayed? He said, you know why I came delayed? I was kissing the feet of my mother. The Prophet ﷺ, he didn't say this to the men. He said, إِذَا صَامَتِ الْمَرْأَةُ شَهْرَهَا وَصَلَّتْ خَمْسَهَا وَأَطَاعَتْ بَعْلَهَا قِيلَ لَهَا تَدْخُلِ الْجَنَّةَ مِنْ أَيِّ أَبْوَابِهَا شِئْتِينَ if a woman fasts the month of Ramadan and prays the five prayers and obeys her husband and protects وَحَسَّنَتْ فَرْجَهَا and protects her private part, it will be said to her, enter the Jannah via any of the eight gates of the Jannah. This is not said for us. It's only for the women. The gates of the Jannah are open in front of them. And the Prophet ﷺ when he said, so being obedient, sisters, being obedient to your husband because you are obeying your Lord, that is an act of ibadah. Get rid of the influence of the Western culture. I'm not your slave. You're not your slave. You are the servant of Allah. So when you are obeying your husband, you are obeying your Lord. The Prophet ﷺ said to a woman that your husband is your heaven and he's your hell. But at the same time, he told the men, the best among you is the best who is better, best for his wives. I'm the best among you for my family, for my wives, and the best among you is the one who is the best for his family. So, okay, so things are balanced. Those who beat women, okay, they're not good examples. The Prophet ﷺ never in his lifetime touched any of his wives. He was threatening only with, with the miswak. What the miswak can do, huh? You know the miswak? What is this? He never touched and hit any woman. That's the Prophet Sallallahu Upon whose heart, upon his heart, the Quran came. But never. And he said, many families and many women, they passed by the household of Muhammad. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They were complaining against their husband. And those who beat their, their wives are not the best among you. This is the status. This is the status of you, my dear sister in Islam. Say, Alhamdulillah, I am a Muslim. Wear your hijab now. You are listening to me. Wear it now if you are not wearing it. Even if it is hot, wear it now. Because the heat and the hotness of hellfire is unbearable. So that is the status of women in Islam. See what the people are going through in America. See the the sufferings of the people, the miseries, suicide in America. In 1997, suicide was the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. 10.6 out of every 100,000 persons died by suicide. The total number of suicide was approximately 31,000 31, in that year. 31,000 souls, people killed themselves because by committing suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among young people ages 15 to 19 years. Every day, 14 young people ages 15 to 14 commit suicide. Every day. Almost all people who kill themselves have Diagnosable mental or sub, uh, substance use disorder. 53% of young people who commit suicide abuse substances. And the list is endless. American Psychiatric Association, the reference. Occurrence of rape. Rape is a serious problem in the United States. The United States has the highest rape rate among countries, which reports such statistics. It is four times higher than that of Germany, 13 times higher than that of England, and 20 times higher than that of Japan. And then they have the gut, and they dare to say, we want to teach people manners and ethics. 
pathetic. Solve your problem first. Huh? Amend your house. Okay? Then come out. This will not happen in Muslim countries. Even if someone committed suicide, there must be something wrong with him. Maybe something mentally de- uh, retarded or something like that. Because the Muslim knows there are red lines I cannot cross. And the Muslim knows when he is facing miseries, he said, oh Allah, oh Allah. He turns to Allah. He knows that. He knows only Allah will solve his problem. I will not go through the figures. You see, figures and everything because there is no time. But what Islam can offer? We are saying Islam is the solution. What can we give them? We gave in the past, and we can still give today. We gave in the past, we brought the humanity, human being, into the light. In the medieval ages, in Spain, the streets are lit, illuminated. People here, in Europe, in darkness. Universities opened in Spain. People here in darkness. And they started sending their children from here to study in the Muslim universities. Those nomadic tribes in Arabia, Muhammad reformed their character and they became bearers of light and they constructed the most beautiful civilization and just civilization in history. I'll just go through some of our contributions to the current civilization. Muslims invented the zero. Zero, Muslims invented it. And it's called sifr. Sifr. It is in English. S-I-F-R. Sifr. <coughs> Trigonometry, sine, tan- tangent, cotangent, etc. Muslims are the ones who invented that science. Algebra, Muslims. Physics. The Muslims sent, they made a clock at the, during the caliphate of Harun al-Rashid. And they sent that as a gift to the emperor, uh, Charlemagne. Okay? When they received it, they thought this is something magic. See, to what extent the Muslim civilization was ahead, advanced. Optics, Muslims, Ibn al-Haytham, the globe. Who drew the globe? Idrisi. This globe you see today, who drew it? The Idrisi. The Idrisi is the one. When Magellan when he wanted to go to the the Far East, he came to an Arab expert sailor, Ahmed ibn Majid from the UAE, in Ras al-Khaim in particular. And he gave him the maps. He said, these are the maps, follow them. Columbus, when he reached America, Muslims, they reached America before Columbus. Columbus didn't discover America, as they are saying, but Columbus was discovered in America. So, so now, what can we contribute? What can we give? We have answers for the social problems. They have a problem. So let the churches answer the give them the solution. They don't have. Most of them men are homosexuals, gays. So who will marry the woman? What solution do they have? They don't have. Islam provides the solution. Family. The concept of family in the West is completely lost. I remember the first time I came to this country in in the 80s. And it was raining in London in the afternoon. And there was an old man and a young man was eating a sandwich. And the old man was 
looking at him, staring at him. And then a small piece remained and he threw it into the dustbin. I wished I had a camera at that time. And the old man went to the garby and took it and ate it. And I was watching. So I went to him and I said, why did you do that? He said, I'm hungry. Yes, it's happening here. Why are you opening your eyes? Okay, it's happening. It's happening in America. There are people sleeping in the streets. They don't have homes. If they're people, they can't have homes. And they open their doors for you to receive you as, as refugees. Why? They love you? Have you thought about it? Why they're opening their doors and give you the moment you arrive, home and everything, shelter, everything. And their own people cannot find. Have you thought about it? Because they are after your Muhammad and Fatima, the little ones. They know this generation will pass away and then Muhammad and Fatima are asset for them. That is the long-term strategy they have in the background of their minds. So the family, they don't have it. He said, I don't have my children, they left me, etc., etc. When I asked him, where are your children? He looked at me and he smiled. And Allah is my witness. So Islam is having this. The family. The unity of the family. Parents should be there. The elders should, are respected. The grandchildren are around them. We seek their dua and say, pray for us. That is in Islam. The family is still there. And they are working hard to try to, to demolish that concept of the, uh, the family in Islam. And that we have to concentrate and work hard. To have strong family, because if you have strong families, you have strong community. But if the marital relationships are weak and we have sick relationships, then that is, will be, of course, reflected on the community in general. Islam, dutifulness to parents. We have to be dutiful to them. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, my father, he wants to take my wealth. He said, What? And you are complaining to, the, to me regarding that? You and your wealth belong to your father. You and your wealth. Your father can come to you and say, give me. And you should not ask him why. Zain al-Abideen, see, the situation has changed, brothers. Zain al-Abideen, he asked his brothers, can one of you put his hand in the pocket of his brother and take what he wants and his brother will not resist or ask him why you are doing this? They said, no. He said, you are not my brothers. I say, if my father put his hand, I will grab his hand. See, the situation has changed now. If your father put your, his hand into your pocket, you will say, dad, this is money. Okay, leave it alone. Okay. So the dutifulness to parents, whatever your father asks you, give him, providing that he's not doing haram, of course. And your wife has no right to interfere and say, you are giving your, your parents everything. Say, they are my parents. I cannot find parents huh, anywhere else. They are my parents. They are the ones who brought me up. Dutifulness to the parents. The solution for suicide, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever commits suicide with a piece of iron will be punished with the same piece of iron in the hellfire. That's why a Muslim will not it will not cross his mind to commit suicide. Incest now. In some countries, it is legal to marry one of those close relatives, a daughter or something like that. Incest. And the ruling in Islam, capital punishment. Capital punishment. At the time of the Prophet Sallallahu a man slept with his stepmother. The Prophet Sallallahu he sent one of the Sahaba, he told him, so and so, he slept with his stepmother, go and kill him. That's the punishment in Islam. It's not legal at all. Homosexuality. Homosexuality, the punishment for it, homosexuality in Islam is capital punishment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
he destroyed the town of Sidon, where the people of Lut lived. And because they were doing anal, they were involved in that shameful deed. And Allah sent Jibreel alayhi salam. And Jibreel uprooted the whole town on the tip only of the finger of Jibreel. Jibreel, brothers and sisters, has 600 wings. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel spread one wing, and that wing covered the whole horizon. One wing covered the whole horizon. That is one of the angels whom Allah created. And no one knows the number of the angels. And see the greatness of this angel? That gives you the idea about the greatness of the great creator of the angel. And the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't be terrified or afraid or scared because of the Scud missiles or the cruise missiles. Okay? Because the power of Allah is more than that. So the archangel Jibreel uprooted the whole town of Sidon and took it to such high altitude till the people and the, the inhabitants of the people in the first heaven, they heard the sounds and the cries of the roosters, the diyaka, and the barks of the dog, dogs. And then he turned it, thought that what Jibreel did, and then he turned it upside down. The whole town, because of this shameful deed. And now, in this Jahiliya civilization, it is something legal. And they, they, now they are teaching homosexuality in schools. So don't be surprised if your little son comes and says, Daddy, I am homo. <laughs> because that is the system you are living in. And that we receive lame excuses from the Muslims because they are so content and complacent by living among the kuffar when they are losing their children. If you just smack your little boy, your little child, and he just raised the phone, that child is, is gone forever. In East Ham, a brother came to me and he said, today I'm lucky, I'm grateful to Allah. I said, what happened? He said, my wife felt a little bit tired, so I took her to the clinic, really close. By the time we came back, we found the police. They said, you left the children alone. This time, this is your last time. If you repeat this, your children are gone. And we find people, they are trying to justify they stay among the kuffar. Make it one, the first priority in your agenda to make the hijrah. The Prophet ﷺ, brothers, I will not compromise and I will not, uh, I mean, hide the truth. The Prophet ﷺ made it very clear. He said, I wash my hands of every Muslim who lives among the mushriks. And he said, anyone who revert to Islam, Allah will not accept from him any deed until he leaves the mushriks and joins the Muslims. Muhammad ﷺ said this. So now it's up to you to think about it. Put a plan, I will move after one year, two years, three years, five years, but it's there. That I'm not going to stay forever. I want to save my children. I want to save my children. I want when I meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will be pleased with me. That I will not be held accountable for losing my children. And those who being in traveling in Europe, they come across many cases like this. How many Muslims, they lost their children and they have no control over them. And the children were giving to non-Muslim families. Spencerhood and bachelorhood. Islam solves that problem. Okay, we have surplus of women. Islam solves that problem by the polygamy. Marrying though more than one wife. That's the solution of this. One of the Mashaikh said, he, was, he said, I said this to the woman. I said, half 
a husband is better than none, right? Half a husband is better than none. A quarter a husband also better than none. Third of a husband better than nothing. If you have a quarter of a husband, that means a husband who is married to four wives and he will come to you on the fourth night, say Alhamdulillah. Providing that this husband will look after the four wives and will sustain them financially. Not that, as I heard many brothers, they tell their wives, it is sunnah to have more than wife and he's not working. He's begging the kuffar, but he wants to do this sunnah. <laughs> okay? So first of all, prove to us that you are a man, okay, that you will sweat for your bread and you will not beg the kuffar. Then it is halal for you. Riba which is a curse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah solved that problem. I read an essay, an essay by an article wrote by an economist. He said the problem of the world will be solved when the rate, interest rate becomes zero. What does it mean? When there is no interest. Say when riba is removed. And that's what Islam is saying. Tax. I'm sure many of you are paying tax. And it varies from one country to another country. I don't know what's the rate in this country. What's the rate? 25? Okay. In other countries, it's a nightmare. That's why many people who are from this country working outside, they're happy. They don't want to come here. Because they are gaining and no tax at all. And Islam is give, asking you only to give 2.5%. And that's it. Even if you have millions and millions, nothing else. Nothing is, is, is obligatory except 2.5%, which is the zakah. And that zakah will be taken from the rich, giving to the poor. And that zakah will not be moved from this place to another place until all the people in that area are not in need. And Umar ibn Abd Aziz, he ruled for two years. And what happened during his, his reign? The zakah collectors, they sent a report to him and they told him, we didn't find anyone to take the zakah. We have the zakah with us and we are asking, that is Islam. When it, is, it has been implemented. It's not something theoretical, no. He so said, we didn't find anyone. He said, okay, buy slaves and set them free. They said, we did that. The, the money is still with us. A lot of money. He said, okay, count all those who are not married and get them married. They said, we did that. This is the barakah. This is the, the barakah. When the law of Allah is dominating. When the sharia, this is from the barakah of the sharia. When the law of Allah is governing everyone when it is implemented. <clears throat> Islam solves the moral problem. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala see in this beautiful ayah. You cannot hide anything from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ghafir, يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنِ وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ Which means Allah knows of the tricks that deceive with the eyes. Allah knows the movement of the dishonest eye. I'm sitting with you, I'm looking somewhere else. Allah knows that. Allah knows the meaning of that look. And yet, some people think that Allah will not know these things. Allah knows everything. Allah knows everything before it happens. Prior to its occurrence. Allah says regarding the mushriks and the kuffar on the day of judgment, oh Allah, give us a chance. He told them, and Allah said, had we given them the chance, they would have done the same thing again. They would go back doing the same thing. Allah knows even if we give them the chance, they will do the same thing. Nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot hide anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Aisha radiallahu anha, one night, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa heard someone knocking on the door. So he opened the door, it was Jibreel, Jibreel alayhi salam. 
He said, what is the matter? He said, Allah is telling you to go and make istighfar for the people of Baqia. So the Prophet ﷺ thought Aisha was asleep. So what he did, he re- left the room quietly. Aisha was not asleep. And she felt jealous. And she said, you are doing this on my night? That means you are going to one of your wives on my night? No way. So she followed the Prophet ﷺ and came out. But to her surprise, the Prophet ﷺ was standing in the baqiya and the moon was full. So she came back and he said, you are in, some, in one valley and I'm in another valley. I'm thinking something else and you are doing something else. She went and she covered herself. But her, her breath was rising, going up and down. So the Prophet ﷺ, he entered the room and he said, Ya Aish, not Aisha, Ya Aish. Okay, Mali Araki Rabia. What is this? What happened to your uh, to your body? It grew all of a, all of a sudden. What happened? Are you the one who was in front of me? He said, uh uh-uh. He said, Tell me the truth, otherwise I will receive it now. <laughs> he said, Yes, Prophet of Allah. The Prophet said, see the context. He said, Aisha, you think I will be unjust to you? And he did this to her. Some ignorant brothers, you see, see, this is an evidence for bunching the woman, <laughs> giving her fist in her. They, read, don't, they don't read the context, how he addressed her. Just if you are saying to someone, do you think I'll be unfair to you? That's how he said it. Okay? So Allah informs his prophet everything. And Allah knows anything. And sometimes maybe it will be misunderstood that Allah in the Quran in many places he say, in order to know, in order to know. لِنَعْلَمَ لِنَعْلَمَ He say, see, Allah doesn't know. No, they don't know that this in this context, لِنَعْلَمَ means what? To test. To test. That's the context. That is the context. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَعْلَمْ خَائِنَةُ الْأَعْيُنِ This dishonest eye and lustful look. You have lustful look when you look to a woman. So Allah knows that, and the meaning of it. And Allah knows what is there in your heart. And what your heart conceives, He knows it. Even if you don't utter it, He knows it. So you cannot hide anything from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the Muslims, they know that, they knew that, this, that Allah sees them, He said, that changed their character. Umar ibn Khattab, he issued a decree that water should not be mixed, should not be diluted with water. Milk should not be diluted with water. And one night he was going around at night. He heard a woman telling her daughter, oh my daughter, mix the milk with the water. He said, mom, my mother, Amir al said not to do that. He said, he's asleep now. <laughs> so the daughter, see the imam, he said, if Amir al muminin is asleep, Allah is not asleep. And Umar, he liked that. And he put a mark. And the second day he said to his son, do you want to marry a pious woman? And that was the daughter-in-law of Umar later. So this is how Islam reformed the character of Muslims. By the belief, changing the aqidah, planting the fear of Allah in their hearts. Islam. How many minutes left? Five minutes, okay. Islam. There is no single teaching of Islam that you can say this doesn't sound logical or the rationale will reject it. A challenge. Anyone can come with just one thing that this cannot be accepted in Islam. It is common sense. The creed, the belief itself, so simple, so simple. No complexity. If you now ask any, the Christian, the learned men, the clergymen, DDs, doctors in divinity, okay, tell them, explain to me the riddle of Trinity 3 and 1. They say, it is like that. Take it on faith. Okay? A missionary who became a Muslim, and Allah knows what's happening now to him, he has doctrine in logic. 
And then he said, I spoke to him. He said, when he used to inside the church and, and they were, subhanAllah, preparing him to go to Muslim country to convert the Muslims. And a brother, Muslim brother, was studying there and just gave him the hadith Qudsi and he became a Muslim. Okay? He said, what we are hearing inside when we step inside is, is not is illogical. They used to tell us, put your intellect and rational there outside. But what you are going to hear inside is completely irrational. But in Islam, it's not like that. The doctrinal issues, the creedal issues are so clear. They are so clear and so simple in Islam. So, what can we do now? We have all these things. We can offer solutions for the people. But the people are not ready to receive it. Not to take it from us. What's going on? Okay. So they have to see these things crystallized. They have to see it with their own eyes. They have to see these things in our life. Those who are living among them. So they should say, well, see how beautiful the children of Muslim. See the relationship between the husband and wife. See how nice neighbors they are. So we need now to implement this deal in our character. Put it into practice. Then when they see it, they say, we want to be like that. Though we have the solutions for all their problems. But these problems now, they should see them solved already in our lives. That Muslims are not suffering anymore. They say, what did you do to you? What solved your problems? Islam. But if they are seeing you suffering because you are away from Islam, they say, also Islam doesn't have the solution. When it has. So first of all, we have to become true Muslims and practice Islam. And set the examples. Then and only then, they will come and seek the help. Meanwhile, we can tell them, present these things. These are the solutions. We are peacemakers. We are not troublemakers. We can help you. In Islam, don't you know that? From the zakah, you can give to a non-Muslim? Mu'allafa qulubuhum? We are softening their hearts and giving them from the zakah? And the Prophet ﷺ used to give valleys full of goats and camels to non-Muslims? That is in Islam. The Prophet ﷺ said, he is not a mu'min, he is not a mu'min, he is not a mu'min, he is not a true Muslim who sleeps while knowing that his neighbor is hungry. He said he's not a mu'min, he's not a mu'min, he's not a mu'min, he's not a Muslim, true Muslim. The one who is bothering and disturbing and annoying his neighbor. So that is Islam. That is Islam. Even the Prophet ﷺ, there was a Jew, his neighbor, and he visited the Jew and the Jew was breathing his last. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him da'wah. And he said, say, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So the child looked to the prophet, to his father, seeking permission. The father said, listen to the prophet. And he said, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And he died. The prophet, sallam, was very happy. He was rejoicing. And he came out crying and saying, alhamdulillah, who saved him from the fire. We should carry that feeling within us. Umar ibn Khattab, brothers and sisters, this is Islam. When he was going to Jerusalem to receive the keys from the patriarch of Jerusalem, he passed by a synagogue and he saw a rabbi or a monk taking wudu to pray. So when he saw him, Umar wept and cried. And he said, Amilatun Nasiba. This guy is striving and working hard, but all that is in vain. He's going to hell. So that's why Umar cried. So it is high time to share this mercy with the people around us. 
and to call them to Islam and to work. Your neighbors, one brother, and I, I will conclude, is living in America, and his way of da'wah is unique. He passes by someone, and someone will say, Hi, how are you? He said, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I beg your pardon? What did you say? He said, I am praising my Lord. I'm a Muslim. Islam is like this. Do you want to hear about Islam? <laughs> People that are becoming Muslims on the spot. Because he is sincere with Allah. He said, I go to my neighbors knocking their doors. I'm going to the market. Old woman, do you want anything from the market? That is Islam. Old woman, she said, where, where did it come from? Because <laughs> no one will do that. That is what Islam is. We have to start practicing Islam. And see how the people will enter into the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give us the vision and the understanding of the deen. May Allah give us the sabr and the strength to spread his deen. And may Allah utilize us to, sp to, uh, to spread the deen of Allah. Amin. Walhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad. Wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Anything left? Alhamdulillah. Complete. Okay, Zakum Allah khair. Zakum Allah khair.